that's a question many people are asking about the prevalence. And certainly the diagnostic rate has increased. Um, because we recognize the disorder now, we have methods available for diagnosing the disorder that we didn't have 30 or 40 years ago. They're just much better at detecting it. So I think because of the publicity around ADHD, we have many more cases diagnosed. But the actual prevalence of the disorder, there's some debate about that, about whether or not the prevalence has really changed or just the uh, ability to identify it more accurately. I think it's probably the latter. It probably always had a very high prevalence rate, but we're just getting good at detecting it now. Far and away, the best way to identify these problems is uh, the use of a very good history and rating scales. Uh, many of the tests that some of us learned long ago um, in our graduate coursework in psychology and social work and related fields, uh, we're just not very good at identifying attention problems, hyperactivity, or the combination of the two. Rating scales are so fast inexpensive and accurate. I know when we were developing an attention problem scale, we were shocked at how easy it was to identify those problems very accurately with a very small number of problems. So fortunately, ADHD is quite inexpensively diagnosed. It's very practical, so um, that's fantastic for families and for schools and others that need to make the diagnosis. However, there are many false positives on rating scales. And uh, for myself, I can only rule that out with history. I can give you an example of an adolescent who was referred to a clinic at a previous university. And this fellow um, acquired ADHD very quickly in a matter of weeks. And um, ADHD is simply not acquired like the influenza, for example. So if you have a very rapid onset um, and you have high ratings uh, on inattention hyperactivity, it's probably not ADHD. In this particular case, it was a case of depression. So history and rating scales are usually quite accurate in combination with one another. Yes, an excellent question because it it's really two answers. If you have a case of attention problems only without hyperactivity, it is not that highly related to behavior problems. If you have a case of ADHD combined type where the child has inattention and hyperactivity problems, then it is highly related to conduct problems, oppositional behavior, um, and similar sorts of difficulties. In some cases, aggression. So it depends on the diagnosis. If it's combined type, there's more risk and more uh, comorbidity with behavior problems. Uh, if it's inattention only, primary inattentive type, uh, then you do not have those comorbidities. You're more likely to have academic comorbidities because if you have attention problems, you just have many challenges trying to learn academic materials such as languages and mathematics, for example. Uh, on the other hand, you can be quite highly active, like some gifted children are very, have very high activity levels, and they can still get very good grades in school um, because that's less impairing uh, as far as academic difficulties go. It's an excellent question about why you need information from different sources to make the diagnosis of ADHD, but also to determine the most appropriate interventions or treatment strategies. It's important because a child can behave differently in different contexts. Their behavior in school, because school is so structured and demands so much attention um, and so much sitting still, for example, a child may be more likely to show problems in school because of their having difficulty dealing with that structure versus the family or home, which is a much less structured environment. It's also important, however, to fill out the diagnostic picture by getting information from the child or adolescent themselves. 
in the case of an adolescent, for example, you might see problems with self-esteem that parents are aware of, teachers unaware of, uh, but that's not uncommon for a child who's been challenged by dealing with their um, ADHD for many years on end, for example. Even in the case of um, designing treatments, this information is very important. If a child is placed on medication, it will be important to determine whether or not it's having an intended effect at school versus home, um, versus the child's own behavioral uh, mental well-being. There are at least two important ways uh, where the BASC or similar rating scales can, can help children with, with ADHD. First is the diagnostic part, because you have multiple informants, so you can assess um, inattention and hyperactivity across settings, which is important. It also has separate scales for inattention and hyperactivity. And those two separate scales need to be independently strong in order to do a good job of identifying a child who has a subtype of ADHD, primary hyperactive impulsive type or primary inattentive, inattentive type. Rating scales like the BAS-3 are also really important for monitoring prog progress because there's much research to show that some children who respond really well to medication for ADHD no longer need that medication at a later point in development. So a diagnosis of ADHD really does not determine uh, with great accuracy whether or not a child or adolescent is going to uh, be challenged by these problems long term. So continuous assessment, just like um, a pediatrician would do for any other condition that, uh, that a child possesses um, annually, for example, is really important and rating scales are so inexpensive and practical uh, for that sort of progress monitoring over time so that treatment can be adjusted or ceased altogether at some, hopefully at some point later in development.